again to our discussions and our presentations with regard to the upcoming scriptures for this Sunday, which is the 30th Sunday of the uh, year, church year. And the first reading comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 22, verses 20 through 26. The second reading, a uh, continuation of Paul's letter to, the first letter to the Thessalonians, um, chapter 1, verse 5, the second part of it, to verse 10. And the Matthew Gospel reading is chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. Now, as has been our custom here, we are really taking this opportunity to look at the story of Jesus as recorded in Matthew's Gospel. And a reminder that sometimes certain parts of the Gospel are left out for all kinds of reasons. And that also is the situation uh, this week. As we pointed out last week, uh, Jesus is now again in the temple area. Previous to this, he has told three parables with a message directed sort of toward the leaders. And last week, we began the first of four what are known as test stories or conflict stories. And the first one we heard last week was the question of um, the Heronians and the Pharisees with regard to what should be done with the census tax. Now, the next one is not presented for a reading this week, and this is found in, uh, well, it's the second of the conflict stories and is presented to Jesus by a group known as the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees were the uh, rather aristocratic, aristocratic group who basically lived in and around the city of Jerusalem and whose task it was was to take care of what went on in the temple. Now admittedly, remember, by the time that this gospel is written, the temple <clears throat> no longer exists. It had been destroyed by the Romans in the year 70 of the common time. Matthew's gospel written sometime in the mid 80s. But nevertheless, as the story of Jesus is told, uh, they of course still were in control of what went on in the temple. Now, why do I mention the Sadducees? Because they are the ones that now present a test for Jesus, having heard that Jesus had uh, kind of put Pharisees and the Herodians in place, it's now their turn. Now, the Sadducees, as uh, mentioned, <clears throat> were the uh, pre chief priests of the uh, Jewish religion at the time. We know a little bit that the Jewish tradition of first century world was not monolithic. There was not just one group. It's like some, somehow saying in our day, all Catholics believe the same thing. Well, in some ways that's true, but in another way there are various viewpoints and approaches to understanding our faith that do take place. So it's well to say that both the Pharisees, the Herodians, and the Sadducees all certainly believed in one God and in the power and goodness of one God, but there were ways in which they did not agree. And we know, the estimates are, we know that there were as many as 20 different groupings of Jewish communities within the first century world. Unfortunately, the only ones that have survived are those that are found in the gospel and a little bit in a Jewish writer of the first century known as Josephus. And the, there really are four groups that we are aware of, Sadducees, Pharisees, Herodians, and a group known as the Zealots. We have mentioned them before. They became much more uh, 
active in the first century world as we came well after Jesus' time. They were just kind of formulating in Jesus' time, but had gained ascendancy and some popularity. The zealots, you remember, were what we would today kind of consider revolutionaries. They really wanted to drive out the Roman presence, and they could make a difficulty. Now, the basic distinction was between the Pharisees and the Sadducees with regard to the resurrection. The Pharisees believed that there was a resurrection of the dead, that there was a resurrection that would come, and in much of his teaching, although certainly we're not saying that Jesus was a part of the Pharisee group, his teaching very much and the Pharisees' position were on the same page. In fact, that's perhaps why we find Jesus talking to the Pharisees so often, because there was much more a common ground between them. On the other hand, the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection of the dead. Their argument was that the only place where one went to learn what the message was, was in what was known as the Pentateuch or the Torah or the first five books of the Hebrew Scripture or our Old Testament. If you could not find evidence for some position in those five works, then the Sadducees said it was not the case. On the other hand, as you remember, the Pharisees believed, yes, in the uh, Torah, uh, but also believed in what was known as the prophets. And they also believed, and we'll see this uh, a little bit when we come to the third test, they also believed that there was an importance of interpreting what the pages of Scripture said. So in, in that sense, the Sadducees, I suppose we would say were much more literalist, whereas the Pharisees were more open to uh, developing and expanding uh, and appreciating the law as it fit the contemporary situation. Now I give all of this background because the second test is not, which is not the one we're going to hear this Sunday, this weekend. The second test was presented to the, to Jesus in this way. They say, now there was a man who married a woman and the man died without a male offspring. So according to a long-standing tradition in Judaism, there was a law which is known as the Liverite Law. It was, how often it was actually practiced, we don't know, but we do know that it was a law which said, if a man were to die without a son, it would be the responsibility of a close relative or often his brother to have relationships with the dead man's widow and that the child conceived would then become his heir. Now, uh, in our world, perhaps that's kind of strange and we would not find that uh, something perhaps that we would immediately or even long line uh, agree to. But the Liverite law, and there are a few instances in the Old Testament where this was uh, the situation. Perhaps it goes all the way back to the time of Jacob, when, uh, who had three sons, and you might remember that story. Uh, Jacob's son married, he died, he didn't have a, um, a son, uh, a second son of Jacob, um, was supposed to do the job, he didn't, and he got zapped for it, you can go read this. Uh, the third son, uh, well, he didn't ever got around to it, and so finally, the father, that is Jacob himself, had relationships with that man's uh, wife named Tamar, and there was a son born. So the whole, what's known as the Liberite Law, would have been something that, uh, certainly Jesus w was aware of. Well, now here's how the story goes. Um, 
the second man dies, third man dies, fourth man dies, fifth man dies, sixth man dies. Seven times this woman has um, a husband, and then the passage ends, and finally the woman died. Well, I often think she died. She was just worn out from all of these guys uh, kind of trying to get an heir. Now, the question that the Sadducees now present to Jesus, when, whose wife now is she in the kingdom, in the resurrected life? Now, right away, they don't believe in the resurrection, yet nevertheless, they're presenting a story that um, suggests that that's uh, the case. So Jesus here responds to that question and it's the first time, two of the three, or four tests rather, it's the first of, the, of three to come, where there's something of a scripture uh, study goes on, where Jesus uses scripture. And remember, Matthew is very concerned that if you can find some indication in the, in the tradition that would be in scripture, that it presents Jesus as certainly a wonderful uh, teacher, an important uh, uh, teacher. So what happens here is, first of all, Jesus responds by saying, well, when we die, we, that uh, the kingdom of heaven is different than it is here, and there will be no relationships like we do here in, in this world for uh, children or the need for children. So in the first sense, uh, the pictures Jesus as saying will be like the angels. So that's his first, uh, first part of his response. But then the second part of the response is he says to the Sadducees, now keep in mind that they are, the, if it's not in the Bible, that is in the Pentateuch, it's not to be held. Jesus uh, pictures them as, as saying that in uh, the tradition there is, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's important to see that by using the word I, God is, not God was, that therefore life is eternal and that these three named people are in some ways living on with God. And so therefore it's a kind of subtle teaching that the resurrection of the body is indeed something that is biblically uh, centered. So in a way, once again, we picture Jesus as putting, as it were, the Sadducees in their place. Since they are scripture scholars and scripture consultors, go look at the scripture again. And so in that way, the Sadducees are uh, defeated. So that's a little bit of the background of uh, the second test, which um, now leads to the third test, which is the one that is assigned for our reading this week. And <clears throat> And this is now pictured, all right, Pharisees have been put in their place, Herodians have been put in their place, Sadducees have been put in their place. Now come the teachers, the scribes, and they say to Jesus, Jesus, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And the response of Jesus in this case is perhaps quite well known to everyone where Jesus says, well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and the neighbor, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, what is unique here, in a way, uh, this whole set of commandments that Jesus gives is not unique. In fact, if you were a good Jew, this would be a prayer that you would know or say quite frequently, much like we might say the Our Father quite frequently. It's called the Shema prayer. It begins Shema Israel. Hear, O Israel, that the Lord God is one, and you shall love the Lord, etc. And you shall love your neighbor. Now, it is true that neighbor is understood in the Old Testament as basically being a fellow Hebrew. 
and with some discussion, we know that Jesus expands the sense of neighbor to being anyone in need. And so that uh, is, is a, a different interpretation, if you want, that Jesus brings to um, this story. Now, the Pharisees are the teachers of the law, even though the scribe here has uh, raised it. And when the question is raised, what is the most important? Well, there are a couple ways to notice this. Uh, a very popular teacher or rabbi of the first century was known as Hillel, H-I-L-L-E-L. And when he was asked this question, it was a popular question to ask important teachers, he said, well, if you, you should be able to stand on one foot and whatever, he said, is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. The whole Torah rests on this, and all the rest of the book is commentary, so go and learn. So can you say all of that as you're standing on one foot? Well, you can see that, therefore, um, the commandment was well known. But we also know that, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, that the Pharisees were interested in trying to make applicable the law for the common need. <clears throat> and over a period of time, certainly by Jesus' time, there were 613 uh, laws that had been developed. So you can see this became quite expansive didn't happen over t all at once, did over a period of time, and they even had broken that down. Of these, 248 of these laws were positive, 365 of them were negative. So in other words, things that you should do, and of course, things that you shouldn't do. And then, of course, there was even more uh, breakdown of this. They were known as the heavy or the light commandments. Well, what's a heavy commandment? Very serious. Honor your parents. Obviously, that would be one that uh, everyone should keep. A lighter one will be, well, <laughs> the law of the bird's nest. Well, what did you do with and the eggs in a bird's nest? And so they, they that you, you can see some of these laws got pretty particular and they were considered not that they weren't important, but were lighter, okay? So when the question is posed, what is the greatest, what do you perceive Jesus as the greatest commandment? You can see one way he responds very traditionally. None of his adversaries could really object much with his answer here. On the other hand, the Pharisees would maybe be interested to see what Jesus did with all the array of choices that were uh, before him. And so that's the gospel passage that we will uh, be looking at uh, th this time. And <clears throat> um, uh, the wisdom of this, of course, pictures Jesus as not developing something new as much as bringing something to perfection. Remember that this is a phrase often used in Matthew's gospel. I came not to change the law, but to bring it to something deeper, to something, um, <clears throat> well, richer and more important. And this will establish Jesus as certainly the teacher. But we're going to move one step forward here when we look at the fourth of the test questions offered to Jesus. Or here, Jesus now asks them a question. See, and this is not going to be this, this uh, immediately precedes or follows rather the section uh, that we've just have looked at, but will not be a reading uh, next week or next time. And Jesus opposes now <clears throat> to the quest to um, his audience something which appears in Psalm 110 in the first verse. Now, this is a very popular psalm. In fact, is used uh, a number of times in the New Testament. So remember the psalms, there are 150 of them, which were collected together. 
And many of the Psalms were considered to be written by King David because, of course, the story was that old Dave played the uh, guitar there at times for uh, King Saul, and therefore he's known as the musician. And we do think that he actually may have written not all 150 of them, but uh, some of them. Anyway, in Psalm 110, it is pictured that David is now saying um, to, to the Lord, when David says, God says, David is my son, and whose son is he? How can he call, how can David rather, call his son my Lord? So it's, it's a kind of trick question. You have to go and read it to, to get it. I perhaps, the Lord, uh, well, let me quote it for you. The Lord said to my Lord, Messiah is David's son. How can be, here's the question, how can, and it, it's important to notice, kind of move around a little bit on this, that always the descendant is considered to be inferior to the uh, to the uh, superior, to the to the father who is the superior. In other words, the son would be inferior to to the father. But now uh, the, 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 the the king says about his son, who how can this be that we call the son the Messiah? who is the son of David. So all of this is a kind of trick question to which they can't answer. And from Matthew's point of view, to include all of this is kind of the final contest, if you want, with the authorities, is to picture Jesus as not only the supreme teacher, but also now opens the viewpoint that the son of David is called Lord. And so therefore, some indication of the unique divineness of, of Jesus is brought in into uh, to play here. So that's the fourth of the little tests. And after this, they don't ask him any more questions. So, um, uh, it, it's a um, beautiful tribute. I, I, I've mentioned this before that Jesus is certainly pictured as the teacher, but also is pictured as the new Moses. And so that in this little saying, if David calls him Lord, how is he his son? In this little saying, he is bringing into the mix that Jesus is more than just a teacher, more than just a new Moses, that he is something uniquely, someone rather, uniquely different. And so as this whole series of uh, parables and tests conclude the importance of David's son, and he's called here son of David, is that he is divine, or certainly son of God, takes on the question of uh, divinity, or he is the Messiah. A word here today about the idea of Messiah, and of course this will come up in the next few weeks. We are accustomed to think of Jesus as the Messiah. We are accustomed to think of Jesus as the long-awaited anointed one. Well, now that may be true, but going back to something that we mentioned a little earlier today, the understanding of what it means or what the Messiah or the anointed one of God was all about was not so clear in the first century. It becomes clearer because we, as Christians, accept Jesus as the Messiah. But there were a number of uh, possibilities of a Messiah that were prevalent in the first century world. Categorize them into three. One 
the Messiah might be considered the nation of Israel itself, that God would raise up Israel to again be successful with all the nations. The idea of Messiah here would be that he would surprise overcome, suppress the evil influences and would lead all, not only Israel, but Israel itself would be the Messiah, leading all up the mountain of God into the presence and into the unity that one could have with the one God. So in that sense, some thought a Messiah would be Israel. Others thought, no, it's going to be a group of Jews who will be messianic. And any one of those 24 that I mentioned earlier often at times thought they were messiahs. All the way from those who were down in the Dead Sea area who thought Messiah will come to us who are the prayers, to the zealots who thought that it will come to us who are the revolutionaries, and as we mentioned, to the Pharisees and Sadducees. And finally, the thought that the Messiah would be a single person. So could it be another David? Could it be another uh, Judas Maccabeus? But we, of course, see that the Messiah is Jesus. But I, I just mention this because it was not clear just what Messiah or the Messianic times was all about for those uh, who lived in Jesus' time. But later on, by Matthew's time, Toward the end of the first century, we can see how that term nicely uh, belongs uh, to Jesus. Just a quick word about the first reading, which comes from the book of um, Exodus, which is concerned with the prophets always arguing with Israel, you need to be caring for the poor, the widow, and the orphan, and, uh, and also the alien. Now, I mention this because sometimes we have different views about alien, but in the Old Testament, Israel was always remembered that they had lived in Egypt, and there they were aliens in a foreign land. And so when they came into the Promised Land, do not forget your her heritage, says Moses. Uh, <clears throat> and the section that we hear, chapter 22 of the book of Exodus, from chapter 20 to chapter 23, seems to be the oldest collection of laws in the Old Testament. So I mentioned that it's incorporated into the Exodus account, which is the story of the uh, deliverance of e Israel from e Egypt. But again, Israel is constantly reminded of its obligation to the widow, to the alien, and to the orphan. Now it is true that these need not be permanent stages. The alien, who is living apart from his community, could have been restored back to him at another time. The widow, who lost her husband, could marry again, and therefore, because remember that when a widow, uh, she became a widow rather and lost her husband, it was the responsibility of either her father, her son, uh, to take care of her, or some other family member but the possibility of remarriage was there. And the orphan, well, it was possible that another one of the kin would take in this child and raise him or her, and so they wouldn't be an orphan. But I mention this because it's uh, kind of important to see that Israel's social concern social obligation and responsibilities to those who were, and again, I put this in the category of the poor. The poor are those who, in the law, cannot speak for themselves, who have no voice with regard to their concern. And so who becomes the spokesperson for the poor, for if not the prophets, the spokesperson for the needy. And of course, there is another beautiful ad advocacy of Jesus that he speaks always and how regularly uh, we hear that. So, um, and, and finally, just quickly, the idea of money lending. Well, uh, often Israelites were loaning money to their 
uh, contemporaries, that is to fellow Jews, but sometimes also would loan it to others. And this is where the question of no, uh, you can't lend money and get interest from it. Now at another point and another day, we'll come back to kind of look at this because unfortunately sometimes we associate the Jewish community's ability to have money, but the upshot of that is the reason why they found that themselves in that position had something to do with the Middle Ages, but that is another story that we maybe will explore at another time. Once again, thank you for being with us today.